And um, good. And then everybody's favorite part when I try to put the computer in tablet mode. So let me first put me to full screen for chapter eight. Okay, and I'm going to hold my breath. Gently place it into tablet mode. Don't say anything. Okay. Okay, good. All right, so that works. So I just have to remember to be careful. Okay. All right, good. So let's go ahead and um, we're going to cover the first part of chapter eight tonight, which is going to deal with not for profit accounting. Not for profit accounting, you can expect. 10 points on the exam, 10 points, okay? Uh, when we get to government, government can be, um, you know, up to 15 to 20 points on the exam. So there are a lot of questions on government and not-for-profit. And again, if you haven't had exposure uh, to government not-for-profit at all, um, you know, you could, you could uh, you know, really have a problem on exam day. So that's what I'm gonna focus on this in the time that we have left. And so I'll talk to you more about government and the point value next time when we finish up chapter eight. But I just want to go ahead and jump into the introduction of not for profit. Okay. Now, the entities that are going to be using not for profit accounting are falling into three categories. And then there's sort of a catch all of other not for profit organizations. Okay, and for example, labor unions, museums, these sort of things. Now, we will talk about the specific accounting that's used by different not-for-profit organizations, basically these three right here. Okay, we'll talk about that towards the end of our discussion tonight. Um, what happens is the way FASB, and we're using the accounting standards, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, they set the accounting standards for all private sector entities, including not-for-profit organizations. And what happens is they have basic general accounting that is the same for all of the different not-for-profits. And then there are only a few kind of bells and whistles that are different for these different organizations. And we'll cover some of those towards the end. But hospitals, educational institutions like colleges, voluntary health and welfare organizations like United Way are going to use, you know, 90% of what they do is substantially the same. And that's what we're gonna cover at first. And then we'll talk a little bit more detail about some of these others um, towards the end. So you come over to the next page and you take a look at what they tell us about not-for-profit organizations. They, like for-profit entities, use full accrual accounting they use generally accepted accounting principles that are organized by the Financial Accounting Standards Board, FASB, okay? And um, they are basically um, going to focus on the organization as a whole, okay? And the only reason we're making that distinction here is, um, you know, not-for-profit organizations could have various funds like endowment funds and these sort of things. But when we report externally, we focus on the organization as a whole. So you start to look and you say, well, look, if we're using full accrual accounting, which we use in for-profit, and we're focusing on the entity as a whole, what you do in for-profit, why do we need you know, half a chapter? Why do we need 10 points set aside for not-for-profit accounting? Well, a couple of things. One, the presentation of the financial reports is a little different. The structure, how things are presented is different than what you would see in for-profit accounting. The second issue really centers around revenue recognition. I'm doing the annoying quotes because with not-for-profits, revenue is really what? Contributions. Instead of individual, instead of the not-for-profit earning those um, revenues by providing some sort of service, they are expecting what? Their donors to contribute. And so we're going to have to structure our financial reports in a way so that donors can see, hey, they've recognized some contributions. And now how are they using those contributions to accomplish the goals of the not-for-profit? 
Now, as I've mentioned, we follow the accounting standards of the FASB. And so the, um, the FASB accounting standards codification is in play here. That means that you could have a research question dealing with not-for-profit organizations on your uh, exam. So you should be aware of that. Now, easy point, easy point alert. If you get a question on the CPA exam that asks you about a not-for-profit organization and you can't figure anything else out, in the first cell where they ask you the section of the codification, the number that you will put in is 958. That is the section that deals for not-for-profit. And even if you couldn't figure anything else out, you would get partial credit for at least putting in that 958. So you just got to remember that, if you will, area code that you're in the 958. That's the first three numbers that you would put in, okay? Assuming you couldn't figure anything else out, and you probably could, okay? And what they do is they basically start the codification over again by putting 958, and then the next three numbers correspond to, say, statement of cash flows questions that would be covered under FASB topic 230. And so if you're looking up something statement of cash flows for not-for-profit, then you know that your first three numbers are 958, your second number set three numbers are what? 230, because that's where the statement of cash flows is covered in the codification. So something to keep in mind, okay? Now, the required financial statements. Required financial statements are the statement of financial position, which is like the balance sheet. The statement of activities, which is like the income statement and statement of retained earnings combined. Statement of cash flows, which is very similar to the statement of cash flows uh, that we would see in for-profit accounting. And we can use, just like you can in for-profit, either the direct or indirect method. Now, I need you to flashcard the names of the required financial statements for not-for-profit organizations. I know that's annoying that you have to flashcard something like this, but this is an easy question. And they do ask that from time to time, which of the following would be a required financial standard of a not-for-profit organization? But you got to remember the names. They don't use balance sheet. They don't use income statement. They use a statement of financial position. They use a statement of activities. So flashcard that, and again, if you were looking up something on the statement of cash flows for a not-for-profit, in the codification, you would look up 958-230. If you were just looking up something for, say, the for-profit version of statement of cash flows, your first three numbers, your area code, if you will, would be 230. Okay? All right, good. Now, the other thing that is supposed to happen, and I want to just look back to something else here, um, is an entity needs to disclose, report expenses by natural uh, and, and uh, reporting expense by nature and function, okay? So all not-for-profit organizations must report information about the functional and natural classification of expenses in one location. Okay, now they give some latitude as to how that would be presented on the face of the statement of activities as a schedule in the notes or in a separate financial statement, uh, which is given no name by FASB. This statement used to be called the statement of functional expenses. And so I call this financial statement the Prince financial statement. And now we call it the financial statement formerly known as the statement of functional expenses because it now has no name, okay? Maybe you guys don't know who Prince is. I should probably update that joke, okay? Now, if you come over and you take a look, uh, I want you to put down here, um, C, page 14, because this kind of stands out a little bit as I'm going to adjust my camera. It's kind of annoyingly out of the shot there a little bit. Um, if you take a look, um, I'm going to show you page 14 because, you know, you're kind of, what is this thing? So let's just, you know, take a peek forward at page 14 so you can kind of see 
what this, and it used to be a statement that was required for some not-for-profits. Now, all not-for-profits at least need to disclose this information, okay? And this is what we're seeing on page 14. So what happens? If you take a look, going back to page 13, we have the statement of activities, which is like the income statement, and we're going to cover this in more detail in a little while. And then if you take a look at their expenses, say for program alpha, the expenses were 13,926, I guess that's 13 million, whatever. And then you come over to this statement on page 14 that has to, they have to disclose this information somehow. And you see that they spent 13,296. Now, what did they spend 13,296 on? Well, this is where we get into what? Now a natural classification of expenses where you start seeing, okay, they had quite a few salaries making up that number, more than half of it. They had some other uh, grants to other organizations and so on. So somewhere in the footnotes or on the face of the statement of activities, or they could just add this as a separate statement, they must disclose information of this nature. All not-for-profits, okay? All right, good. So we can go back to what page five was it? Where were we? Page five, I guess. Okay. All right, good. Now you come over and I want you to flashcard that, that all not-for-profit organizations have to at least disclose that information. Okay. All right, good. Now you come over and let's now start to take a look at the uh, various financial statements. Again, statement of financial position is like L-I-K-E. The balance sheet, right? Okay, but we don't call it that. We call it the statement of financial position. And so like a balance sheet, it will have assets, it will have liabilities, okay? Nothing shocking there. And then net assets, they're calling it the equity. But the reality is it is like RE retained earnings, okay? We're not having not-for-profit entities issuing stock and having additional paid in capital and treasury stock and all these other things that make up the equity of a for-profit entity. It's really just the retained earnings portion uh, that uh, the net assets is really uh, analogous to. Okay, so let's just go ahead and let's take a look at that net assets. Okay, and when we look at net assets, net assets can be with or without donor restrictions. Okay, net asset without donor restriction. Let's talk about that first. So, net asset without donor restrictions are available to finance general operations and may be expended at the discretion of the governing board, okay? So if you have net asset without donor restrictions, they are not restricted by donor imposed restrictions. Only donors can restrict the use of an asset. The board of directors cannot restrict, okay? So they are not restricted by donor imposed restrictions. Now, famous CPA exam trick. They love this. What they'll do is they'll tell you that the board has earmarked or has somehow restricted the use of those assets. Well, the board can't restrict assets. So even though the board has designated those assets for some specific use, they are still considered without restriction. Okay, so the exam loves to do that. They love to sit there and make it seem like it should be reported with donor imposed restriction, but the board can't impose a donor imposed restriction. Okay, okay, good. Now, net assets with donor uh, imposed restriction, and let's just take a look. We have what? We have net assets with donor restrictions are subject to specifically externally impose limitations made by a donor, okay? So the donor now somehow restricts these assets. So when a donor gives assets, they don't have to restrict them, but they could. And if they do, they are often called out to support some activity, 
for a specific investment, use in a specific period, acquisition of long-lived long assets. And um, the, the donor says, hey, you have to use those assets for this purpose. Now, donor could get a donate and not impose a restriction, then it would be considered without donor restriction. But if the donor puts some sort of restriction and those continue on to the next page, some sort of asset that is not to be sold or donor restriction that are perpetual in nature uh, with the stipulation that they'd be invested and provided permanent source of income. So the donor maybe will say, here's a stock, hold the stock forever but you can use any increases in value of that stock or dividends. And they may restrict how those are used, or they may say, hey, you can use them however you see, foot, uh, see fit in the not-for-profit, okay? So two categories of net assets with and without donor-imposed restrictions. Only donors can impose. They don't have to, but they're the only ones that can impose restriction, okay? Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at this statement of financial position. I'm going to jump you over to um, this page first. I don't understand why they put it in the order they did, but um, that doesn't mean we have to stay with that order. Okay, so statement of financial position, like the balance sheet, assets. Notice, guys, we're listing those assets in order of liquidity, right? Cash first, longer term items coming at the bottom, right? Liabilities, again, in order of liquidity. And then there's our net assets with and without donor restrictions. And you can see the two amounts there for your two, whatever, okay? Now, when you come over and you take a look at the uh, previous page now, just come back over to the previous page, what we have here is a disclosure of the nature of the net assets with donor restrictions. So let's just go ahead and start with that number tying to the previous page, right? So that was the total that was with donor imposed restriction. And then they start listing out the nature of the restrictions for a specific purpose, subject to the passage of time, subject to not-for-profit spending policy and appropriation. Now, that sounds a little bit oxymoronic because you're saying, well, John, if it's subject to not-for-profit spending policy, then how are we saying that's with a donor-imposed restriction? Well, often the restriction will be by state law. So the state law will say, well, look, here's, um, you have a, a uh, you have a uh, contribution and they said the principal has to maintain, be maintained. And it's an endowment. Endowment means you have to maintain the principal, but you can spend earnings or increases in value. Well, state law will then come in and say, well, look, you have to have a way that you're going to plan to spend that, like 5% of the growth can be spent per year or something. In other words, they don't want there to be an endowment fund and all of a sudden the not-for-profit goes out like a drunken sailor and all of a sudden puts that endowment underwater. So they'll have to have some way as to how they're gonna spend that money. So that would be listed here as subject to not-for-profit spending policy and appropriation, meaning that, hey, they're going to hold this principle forever uh, and how they're going to spend these various uh, earnings and whatnot are still limited to some sort of state law or some sort of agreement with the donors to how they'll spend that money out. Uh, that's the same uh, thing here, subject to appropriation expenditure when a specific event occurs. So that's more consistent with a donor restriction. They'll say, hey, you can spend this money when you have accomplished a certain amount of, you know, and it may even be a non-financial measure that they're using there. And then they could give us some things that we can never spend. For example, here's a piece of land and you got to hold the land forever. We don't want you to sell that land off. Okay. So that's just giving you an idea of the nature of what these donor imposed restrictions were. And that would be something that would be uh, disclosed by the not-for-profit. Okay. The other thing 
is when you take a look here for the net assets without donor restrictions. Remember, we saw over there, let's just go back for a second, guys. I apologize to keep flipping back and forth. But when you, um, it's actually down here. When you looked here and we had this 92,600, they're saying, hey, of the 92,600, okay, here are some board designated. So even though it's still considered without donor restrictions, now they're calling out some board imposed uh, limitations and designations for the use of that money. Okay. All right, good. So that gives us a sense of the uh, statement of financial position. So let's go ahead and take a look at a couple questions now here. And uh, let's see what's going to happen. And is the poll going to come here? Yeah, okay, it's on the main computer tonight. So that's good. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and um, put this up. I think this is a pretty straightforward question to move us along a little bit quicker. And um, yeah, most of us got this right. Um, and this is one of those questions and why I asked you for the flashcard on the, um, you know, on this and that it's, it's an easy question, but it can be, uh, it can be tricky in that, um, uh, and that when you look at it, you know, we did have a statement of financial position, but it didn't have the word changes. Okay, so A is wrong for that reason. Yeah, we did have to prepare a statement of cash flow. Some of the things you just got a flashcard and have them, you know, in your head when you walk into the exam. I mean, you know, these other statements are relevant to government, so they might make some of those names of those statements in with the discussion of what is required for not-for-profit. Statement of cash flows are the correct answer here, okay? Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at this next one. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and um, put this one up because I think most of us have worked this one. Um, and so let's just take a look. And yeah, uh, everyone who participated got this right. 
if there's no donor imposed restriction, which was the case with this building here, then we can go ahead and uh, call that what net assets without donor restrictions. Good. Okay. All right, good. Let's take a look now at our next statement, the statement of activities. Okay, statement of activities is like L-I-K-E, like the income statement, I-S. Okay, now uh, this is important, this statement of activities discussion, because when I look at questions, it seems to me that the examiners like to focus on the statement of activities and the approach that I uh, prescribe to students for this material is to um, really, when you get a question, to make yourself a little statement of activities that that kind of you know follows the narrative of the question. And when you do that, it's interesting how easy these questions become, as opposed to just sort of trying to imagine everything that's going on in the statement of activities in your head. And so I'm going to give you a little example, and then I'm going to show you how to apply that approach uh, to some of our questions coming up. Okay, so what happens? We have the uh, statement, um, the statement of activities, oops, and we have these various pieces of the statement of activities, and they tell us the required elements are to report the change in the total net assets, change in net assets without donor restrictions and change in net assets um, with donor restrictions. So when you look at that, think of it this way. If you eliminated all the other components of stockholders equity other than retained earnings, you could call the statement of retained earnings the what, or you could call the income statement the change in retained earnings for the period, right? So really what we're doing on the statement of activities is explaining to you why the retained earnings of the not-for-profit, which we call the net assets, change for the period. And it's basically revenue minus expenses will equal the change in the retained earnings. And rather than report it in total, we do report it in total, but then we also report it by category, those with and without uh, donor restrictions, okay? So you come over and you take a look and when we have amounts that come in, okay? And um, there'll be um, classification of revenues, gains and other support. And when those come in, they will come in as net assets without and net assets with donor restrictions, okay? Now let's just go ahead and take a look at the nature of assets with donor uh, without donor restrictions and we have fees from rendering services so if the not-for-profit charges for a service then that would be considered a revenue that has come in without a donor restriction contributions that again have no explicit donor stipulation gains and losses recognized in, in investments that are not accompanied with specific uh, donor restrictions. Again, a donor could say, look, here's a stock, hold the stock forever. Any increases in value in the stock or dividends paid by the stock, you can use however you see fit. Other donors may say, I want you to use the increases in value and dividends or whatever that come out of this stock that I'm giving you, hold the stock forever. And I want you to use those for a specific purpose then those uh, earnings and increases in value whatnot would actually be considered as having uh, donor restrictions, okay? So flashcard, the nature of those that come without donor restrictions, okay? Now I'm not gonna have you flashcard uh, the nature of things that are with donor restrictions because, you know, it's pretty obvious if they're saying there's a specified purpose, or contribution subject to the passage of time or contributions with restrictions that are temporary in nature or contributions requiring investment in perpetuity with returns eligible for um, you know, some sort of appropriation in concert with whatever the donor has said, okay? Now, since I am basically going to have you use the format of the statement of cash, um, the format of the statement of activities to um, answer these questions, 
I want to give you a quick little, cute little example of how we might use the, um, how the statement of activities would be presented. So if you turn back to page two, um, you have a page there for notes, okay? So um, let me do this before I forget, guys, because I don't want this to get lost. So what page were we on? Page 13. Page 13, thank you. Oh, well, technically, I guess. Yeah, okay. So what I want you to do on page 13, at the bottom of page 13 there, let's see. No, we went on 13. We went on 13. What page were we on? Page 11. Okay, at the bottom of page 11, okay, I want you to put down there, see page two. Okay, so that when you are looking at that, then you'll come back to this little example on page two. Okay, and what we're going to do is have a made up not for profit organization. It's made up. I'm going to call it Save the Canines. Okay, and what this little imaginary not-for-profit is going to do, okay, and I have to say that it's imaginary because I had a student one time email me and say, oh, I want to contribute to Save the Canines, and I'm like, it's not real, it's just, a, just, just imaginary, okay, all right, so I just want to make sure that there's not a real organization, uh, just something that I made up, Save the Canines, in this little made-up scenario, um, this Save the Canines has as its purpose that it's going to, um, you know, find homeless dogs, cats, whatever. We'll stick with dogs, I guess, because since we're saying canines, find homeless dogs and find them a home. Okay, that's what we're going to do. Okay, so we're going to solicit contributions and we're going to do the 2021 20, Statement of Activities. Right. That's what we call our income statement. And we will have contributions. And contributions will come in either without donor restriction Okay, rest is for restriction or what? or with donor restriction. That's it, those are the two options, right? With or without donor restrictions, okay? Every time I say that, I keep hearing that there was a song by U2, with or without you, with or without donor restrictions. Okay, don't make me mad or I'll keep singing. Okay, so with or without donor restrictions. Now, what happens? Um, does anyone want to give any money to save the canines tonight? Matthew? Sure. Okay, good. How about 10 grand? That's the smallest contribution we take. I ain't got that on me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I won't hold you accountable for it, okay? So we're going to go ahead and let you say that you're going to contribute 10 grand, okay? Now, Matthew, when you contribute this 10 grand, you're going to tell me, hey, it has to be used for the Fluffy program. Fluffy program is a program where we buy doggy shampoo and hair dryers and doggy curlers so that the dog will be all nice and fluffed up and cute so somebody will take it home, right? We call that... Uh, the fluffy program. Okay. So what happens? We sit here and since Matthew, you're telling me it's got to be used for the fluffy program. When that contribution comes in, we would list it as a contribution with a donor restriction, right? On our statement of activities. It's like our income statement, just like we would list revenue at the top of an income statement, right? Okay. So we got that contribution, but we have to list it as having come in with donor restriction. 
Now, let's say that in that first year, we don't spend any of the money. If we don't spend any of the money, how much are our expenses? Not a trick question. Zero. Zero. Good. So now we will report what? We will report the change in net assets. Okay. And we have to report it by category and total. I'm not going to show the total, guys, because it would just be the total of the two columns. But the change in the net assets without donor restrictions is how much then? Not a trick question. 500. Okay. I'm not sure where you got 500 from, but. I'm just joking with you. Oh, okay. You messing with me? You talking to me? Okay. So it's what it's 10, it's zero. And the without donor restriction, thanks to Matthew, is what? 10,000. 10,000. Okay, good. Statement of activities achieved its objective. I can see why the net assets change. You had a $10,000 contribution with a donor restriction. Nothing else happened that increased your net assets with donor restriction. Okay, good. Now we go into now 2022. Okay, so let's just do our statement of activities for 2022 now, okay? And what happens? In 2022, we solicit contributions um, and we have the what? Without donor restriction, we have what? with donor restriction, okay? And um, in 2022, our fundraising falls off a bit, okay? So in 2022, our contributions, that says contributions are zero. But we start to spend some of that 10,000 um, as we were instructed to by Matthew. So what happens? When that's the case, okay, you have to report a reclassification adjustment. And you have to say satisfaction of program restriction. So let's say we spend 6,000 of the money as Matthew instructed us to, what happens? When we do that, then we would report 6,000 coming out of the with donor restriction and into the without donor restriction. And that sounds like some sort of weird poetry, right? Out of the with and into the without, okay? And so you come over and you report that reclassification adjustment and then you report the expense And the expense is what? $6,000, because I spent the money the way Matthew told me on the Fluffy program, the way the donor instructed me. And so now when I report the change in net assets, I have the situation where my what? My with donor restriction has come down 6,000 my without donor restriction came up six by the reclassification, but came down by the expense. So that is what, zero is a change in net assets. And again, I'm not showing you the total, but we'd also report the total here as well. Okay. So by definition, guys, all expenses appear in the without donor restriction column. Let me repeat that. 
all expenses appear in the without donor restriction column because if I'm spending the money, I must have satisfied the restriction. Otherwise, how would I spend the money? So the way FASB looks at this, hey, all your expenses get reported in the without donor restriction column. Question. Yeah, what do you do with general expenses that are required to keep the organization running? I mean, during the first year when you got no uh, revenues, but um, you had only a donor restricted uh, expense, how did the organization keep going? I, I, or do you make some allocation to the with donor restricted? No, um, I just assumed they had no expenses. Okay. All right, so this is just a real simple um, example. Yeah, this is just to see the mechanics of the statement of activity. Got it. Um, you know, what we're going to see is we group, uh, just to kind of answer your question before officially answering it, um, what we're going to see is they require us to group our expenses into program versus support. So things like general and administrative expenses, you know, that aren't specifically spent on a program uh, would be listed that way. Um, now, having said that, um, you know, entities could allocate some general administrative expenses to programs using some sort of, you know, cost allocation system. I looked at a, a not-for-profit organization when I was working with the Government Accountability Office, an entity called um, the Housing Assistance Council, which is the East Coast version of Habitat for Humanity. And they receive an appropriation from uh, Congress every year. And then uh, the Republicans wanted us to look and see if they were you know, really using the money appropriately and stuff. And uh, so that entity had a fairly sophisticated way as to how they allocated their um, general administrative program uh, expenses to programs. So you could also allocate them, but then there's some that are just going to be listed as pure support. The thing that was funny about that, so when we briefed the committee staff, so you have, you know, the Congress is set up by committees, but you don't really talk to the Congress people, you talk to their staff. And when I was listing out what my findings were on the job, I was on the phone in San Francisco and they were on the phone in Washington, along with GAO folks were in the room. And all of a sudden the line just went dead and we couldn't get them back. And we're like, what the hell happened in the middle of the presentation? And so when they finally, the GAO guys finally got back to the office, you know, they called me back and I was like, what happened? They said, they didn't like what you were finding, dude. So they hung up. So um, that was kind of okay. Thanks a lot. If I had known that, I wouldn't have worked so hard on this assignment. They're going to hang up while I was briefing them. Anyway, so, all right. So, um, but we'll, we'll, we're not going to talk about the allocation process, but we'll see, you know, that they break them out into the different uh, areas. Okay. All right, good. So um, let me go back now. Any question? Okay, good. So let's just go back. What page? Um, it was 12 or 13, I think. Yeah, I think it's right here. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, good. Now we're ready for page 12. And here we go reclassification and just visualize what we talked about in year two when we spent the 6,000. And they tell us that what don't, when a donor restriction is satisfied, a reclassification is reported on the statement of activity. Reclassifications are items that simultaneously do what? And I wish they would have written this the other way. Decrease one class, the what with donor restriction and increase the other class with donor restriction, right? Isn't that what happened there? Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and expense classification and we can have our expense classification by program and by support, okay? Program, just put down here, things and FPs do, okay? If you're a university, education, hospital, patient care, right? Save the canines, fluffy program, okay? 
Uh, support services, just put next to support services, things. NFPs do to survive. So what happens? Got to do fundraising. Got to do what? Management in general. Got to do things like, if you're a membership organization, membership development. Okay, so on the statement of activities, we will need to break out our expenses as to whether they're specific for programs or whether they are specific for support. Okay, now you come over and you could have combined costs and combined costs that combine fundraising efforts, say with education um, or a program service should allocate between the combined functions. So flashcard that, let's say as Save the Canines, we determine that the reason dogs end up homeless is because people get them when they're puppy and they have all these great intentions, but then they don't know how to take care of the dog and they just kind of let the dog, you know, go. And, you know, they take them and dump the dog somewhere, right? And so we think, well, if only there was appropriate education, people would know how to take care of the dog and you would be more like a member of the family, et cetera, right? So we decide we're gonna put on a doggy grooming class. And so, I don't know, let me pick on somebody else. Autumn, how much you wanna pay for this doggy grooming class? Oh, um, 150. 150, I'll tell you what, give me a uh, give me a thousand for it. Okay, Come fine. On, we're, trying, San Francisco. We're, trying, we're trying to help the dogs. Come on. Yes, let's okay. help. Them. So what happened? There was a fundraising appeal in this educational program, wasn't there? Okay. So what happens? If the cost of the class was say, you know, for, for me to put on the class, and I'm gonna make the numbers hard on myself, but you guys will help me. Say I had to spend five thousand dollars to put on the class. Well, Autumn was willing to pay one hundred and fifty. I got a thousand out of her. So what? Fifteen percent of the money can be seen as potentially what? As potentially being for the um, program, and the remaining eighty-five percent being considered for the um, for the uh, fundraising. So I would put what? 0.15. 5,000 times 0.15, guys. How much? 5,000 times 0.15. 750. 450. 750. 750. Okay. And the remaining, what, 4,250? 4,250. 4250 the remaining 4250 is going to be fundraising right and the 750 would be program x whatever program e for education i guess okay so when i report that on my statement of activities i would allocate potentially and, and this is not written in standard that you allocate it based on the revenue you just have to have some rational means of allocating that Okay. Okay, good. Now let's look at this statement of activities now. And um, hey, it's not as simple. There's a little more traffic on this statement of activities than was the case with our little example, because obviously, you know, entities just don't receive one donation in a year. So they could receive donations with, without donor restrictions. Okay. Uh, fees are typically considered without donor restriction. When I charge a fee for something, that comes into without donor restriction, okay? So I can't have a situation, I had you flashcard that on the uh, other page up there. Um, I can't have a, a situation where as a not-for-profit, I'm providing a service. And then they start telling me how I have to use the money that they had to give me for the service doesn't work that way. If I provide you a service as a not-for-profit, I then get to use that money as I see fit, okay? Um, notice investments, okay? 
could be what with or without donor restriction. It just depends on what the donor says I should do with earnings. Okay, let's look at the reclass section. Okay, look, just like we had in our simple little example, amounts come out of the with donor restriction and go into the without donor restriction as we satisfy a program restriction, as we satisfy a what equipment acquisition restriction, expiration of time restriction. Okay, so we've got what program equipment time. You could, uh, if you needed to, sort of remember the nature of how status, uh, restrictions are satisfied using PET, put your PET in a not-for-profit organization, save the canines, right? Okay. Now, notice, again, all expenses are coming down what? Are coming down into the without donor restriction column, and they are listed by program. They are listed what by support. Okay. I'm Question. confused about one of the lines. Yeah, uh, there's one, um, the one that says appropriation from donor endowment and subsequent satisfaction of any related donor restrictions. That doesn't appear to be the sum of the ones before it. Is that a sep that's a separate category? That's the thing under the time restrictions. A yeah, it's a separate category. It, so it's a separate. The total is right here. <coughs> the total is right here. That's a separate category. That blue is the total. So is the don don so a, a donor endowment is a separate thing from a program description restriction, right? Um not necessarily. I mean, it depends on what the donor has stated that endowment is to be used for. So an endowment says, here's a million dollars. Hold the million dollars forever, but you can use the um, increases in value from this to fund a program. Okay, um, I've and, got it. So, so this is, okay. I, I didn't really understand the difference between a donor restriction and an endowment. That I get yeah. that now. Well, yeah, the endowment is more like hold the corpus, hold the principal forever, okay. and then you can spend the money. And then, and then, cause what's, what's confusing there, Kathy, to me is, well, what appropriation are we talking about? Well, the appropriation is often stipulated by state law. The state law will come down and say, hey, look, you can't just blow through that money all in one year because you've had these earnings. So even within the earnings, they'll have a certain way that that has to be distributed. Okay. And there has to be something in place that says, hey, you can draw down 5% of the earnings per year or something like that uh, so that they don't just blow through uh, those funds and say in any one year. So it's a way to keep a governor on what's going on with those not-for-profits because, you know, we're talking about big bucks in some cases. I mean, this is not, you know, this is not chump change, right? Uh, yeah. So in, in many cases. Okay. Okay, good. Question? All right, good guys. Uh, again, we have to report our expenses, okay, by major classes of program or uh, by support activities, okay? So just flashcard that, I think we've said that enough times. And um, then remember guys, we have to provide that reporting expenses by natural, um, you know, function, you can see the nature of some of the natural expenses. And then I went through the way this disclosure works, tying it back to the statement of activities. Question? Okay, let's take a look at a couple questions now. And um, let's see, I'll tell you what. Let's do the first one together so I can show you how I want you to make up when you get questions like this, dealing with the statement of activities, 
how you just make yourself a little statement of activities to um, help you to answer the question. Okay, so let's just go ahead. Oh, I don't want the poll yet. I don't want the poll in the end of this poll. Okay, and let's just take a look at this. All right, so we have this, uh, the beginning of the year, Baker Fund. By the way, a non-governmental, not-for-profit corporation, they'll always say that. We will talk about categories of government, not-for-profits, when we talk about government. But government not-for-profits use the same accounting uh, structure as any not-for-profit. I mean, any government entity, excuse me. So it's not like there's a whole separate set of study that's going to go for government not-for-profit. You know, a university like San Francisco State would present their information in the same manner that the city of San Francisco would. So the structure doesn't change just because we're dealing with but they call that governmental not-for-profits, whereas Golden Gate University is a non-governmental not-for-profit. So don't be confused by that. When they say non-governmental not-for-profit, they're talking about everything we're studying here, and they are not going to be calling out questions about government not-for-profit organizations. So, okay. All right, so let's just go ahead and let's take a look. And they received a contribution of 125000 now, when I look at these um, questions, and I forgot to say this when we were on um, page two. So before, sorry guys, I forgot to say something, an important, an important teaching moment that I wanna try to come back to. Okay, let me just look here for a second, then we'll cover that question. When you look at questions like the one we're about to look at uh, for the statement of activities, okay? What they do is they tell you the whole story and then they ask you about a piece of the statement of activities, okay? So for example, they would say, Matthew contributed $10,000 in 2021 to Save the Canines. In 2022, Save the Canines, spent the money the way Matthew specified. How should Save the Canines report the, 20, the contribution? Answer. With donor restriction? As a contribution with donor restriction in 2021, right? Even though they didn't spend the money until 2022? Yes. How should Save the Canines report the expend, expenditure of the money? As an expenditure without donor restrictions in 2022? As an expenditure without donor restrictions in the year we spent 2022. Mm -hmm. How should Save the Canines report the satisfaction of the program restriction? Three class out of donor restrictions to without? In 2022. Yes. Correct. So that would be considered released from donor restrictions, correct? Release from donor restrictions? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what the, the language that they, yeah, that they use. Okay. Well, we can't trust the CPA exam to be consistent <laughs> on anything. So they could call it a reclassification judgment. They could call it release. Let's take a look now. And maybe you were peeking at that question. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at that question now. And we'll do this first one together. And then I'm going to turn you loose on the next one. Okay. So at the beginning of the year, Baker Fund, a non-governmental not-for-profit corporation, received a contribution of 125,000 restricted to youth activities. During the year, youth activities generated revenue of 89,000 and had program expenses of 95,000. What should Baker report as, there you go, net assets released from restrictions? Okay, so they are using that language there for that question anyway. Okay, so when you get a question like this, you make the whole statement of activities. You put the whole story in the statement of activities. So we got what? We got contribution, And it's with or without donor restriction, right? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so did that contribution come in with or without a donor restriction? With. With. With, good, 125,000 came in. Whoops, I wrote them backwards. Uh, yeah. Why, I don't know why I erased the whole thing. With, out, with, right? Okay. And so it was the whole 125,000. Good. Okay. Then they had, they generated revenue uh, of 89,000. So if they generated revenue, that means they must have charged some sort of money for this service, right? Mm -hmm. Without. How should that come in? Good. That is going to be fees. And they come in under without. Okay, good. And then they satisfied what? They had program expenses of 95,000. So they must have satisfied that 95,000 restriction, right? Mm -hmm. So the money would do what? It would come out of with and go into without. And then come out of without. That would be a reclass, right? Mm -hmm. And then we would report expense of 95,000. Mm -hmm. Is that what should happen here? Yes. Okay, so what should they report as assets released from restrictions? 95,000. 95,000. Okay. You are best off, guys. The fastest way to answer these is the long way. You do this and you keep practicing with this and keep drilling with this. And then you start just doing it almost like a machine when you get questions like this and you save yourself a heck of a lot of time than if you kind of start to try to, you know, dance off of one foot and onto the other while the examiners are up there laughing at you. Is there any convention with respect to like without always goes on the left and with always goes on the right? Yeah, without always goes on the left, with always goes on the right. So the, the reclassification okay. can come <laughs> out. And then the, I like to think of the without column, Kathy, as the plug. You pull the plug and when the drain drains, it drains out of the with into without and out of the bottom of the statement of activities as we now have a decrease in the net assets without donor restrictions being caused by that expense. Great, thank you. Or I shouldn't say a decrease in the net assets without, a decrease in my net assets, period, my retained earnings, right? How does it get out? Because we have the total, it gets out by flowing through the with and out the bottom of the drain, out of the without, that's how it gets out of retained earnings, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Let's try question four, and I'll put you on the clock for this one. I'll put up the poll for this, I should say. Oops. Can you see the poll now? There it goes.
That one's confusing. Who said that? <laughs> <I did. laughs> it's a little bit funky. <clears throat> That's why it's important to prepare the statement of activities. And what's weird about this one is it goes over two years. Oh, okay. We get the contribution in one year and spend it in another. Have you heard that one before of an entity that gets a contribution in one year and spends it in another? No. <laughs> yeah. Save the canines just did that, didn't they? Yeah. Okay, I screwed that up then. <laughs> it happens. I'll tell you what, let's go ahead. I gave you about three minutes. So let's just go ahead and uh, take a look at this one. And uh, it's, it's a hard question, um, but I think you'll get better and better at these. Um, this one, like I was saying while you were working it, has the uh, complication that it goes over two years. So when you get a question like that, you just sit there and you go the full 15 rounds with the question, just writing things up on the statement of activities as it happened, okay? So A is the correct answer, but what happened? In fiscal year ended June 30th, year one, okay? Bar College, a life, large private institution, received 100,000 designated by a donor for scholarships for superior students, okay? So let's just go ahead and we'll make up the little statement of activities for year one contribution came and it's not without it's what yes. with a donor restriction i always write contribution too high came in at a hundred thousand right Mm -hmm. Okay, then we read on and it says on July 26th, year one. Well, that's fiscal year two, isn't it? Mm. If the fiscal year ends June 30th, year one, then in July, we're in fiscal year two, aren't we? Yeah. So in fiscal year two now. What did they do? In fiscal year two, on July 26, year one, Barr selected the student and awarded the scholarship. How should the July 26 transaction be reported on the statement of activities for the year ended June 30th, year two? So they even helped us out to tell us, hey, now we're dealing with year two, aren't we? Okay. So if that's the case, then what? Well, now we have to have the reclass. <sighs> Yeah, we're going to write year two. Sorry, guys. We're going to write it over here. So in year two, and since I bought some more real estate over here, contribution is zero, both with and without. Yeah. Okay. And then we have the reclass, don't we? Yeah. And with the reclass, what's going to happen? The money is going to come out of the with and into the without, isn't it? In year two? Yep. And then I report an expense in year two of 100000 Yep. So is it true that in year two, the what? There was both an increase and a decrease of a hundred thousand in net assets without donor restrictions. Yep. There's the increase. There's the decrease. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's the increase. There's the decrease. Okay. All right. Now, this could have been the save the canines example. <laughs> In year one, Matthew gave a contribution. In year two, save the canine, spent the money the way Matthew specified. How should the 
$6,000 be reported. It should be reported as both an increase and decrease of $6,000 in the without donor restriction column, right? Okay. Okay, good. You're going to get better and better at these. Not for profit and governmental is going to be a piece of cake for you on the exam. Okay. All right. Good. Let's go ahead. Let's take a look at uh, this next question. You gonna put up a poll? I'm trying. Ah, uh, sorry. No, that's all right. Thanks, Brad. Thanks for reminding me. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and do this one thing. Most of us have had a chance to look at this. So, um, yeah, just about everybody got it right. Good guys. Choice C is correct. Um, let's just go ahead and read through this one, though. And I'm going to erase this. It's kind of in the way. Okay, so the following expenditures were made by Green Services, a site protection environment. Uh, they get, list these and they want to know what the fundraising is. Okay, well, fundraising is stuff that you do to encourage contributions. That's it. Printing an annual report and getting an audit is a general and administrative expense, right? So it would be listed under, um, you know, general and administrative. These are all support, but only the actual fundraising is fundraising. Okay. Okay, good. I think we are in a good time for a break here. So let's go ahead and we will um, talk about the statement of cash flows, our remaining required statement for not for profits when we come back from the break. And then we'll start getting into the uh, revenue recognition or contribution recognition criteria. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and um, come back? Let's make it, uh, let's Six, well, it's a funny time right now. What time is it? Um, it's 28. 28. Okay, good. So we'll make it uh, 6.40 then. We'll take 10 minutes, a little over. Okay, so we'll come back at 6.40, guys. And I'm going to pause the recording. <clears throat> And let's go ahead and uh, discuss the statement of cash flows. You ready to turn back on recording? Uh, yeah, no, we're good. Thank you. Yeah, we're good. Okay, all right, good. So let's take a look at the statement of cash flows now. Again, we have to prepare the statement of financial position, the balance sheet, the statement of activities, which we look quite extensively at there, the income statement, and then the statement of cash flows, they tell us, is one of the required statements, and uh, it is covered, and again, 
they say 230, but you, when dealing with the part that's applicable to not-for-profit organizations, of course, you put in the 958, what I call area code, right? Okay, now we are going to see that the statement of cash flows is what we have talked about. Um, well, we haven't talked about it because we didn't go through it, um, but you know about it, the statement of cash flows from your study of intermediate accounting that we have our operating activities, our investing activities and our financing activities. And then the operating activity section is going to be affected um, by whether we use the direct or indirect method. And just like with for-profit entities, not-for-profit entities can choose between using the direct or the uh, indirect method. When we talk about government, we're going to see that government must use the government entities must use the direct method. But for not-for-profits, FASB allows them to choose either direct or indirect. Now, when we take a look at what goes into the operating activity section, and um, it's basically going to report activities um, and um, receipts of unrestricted resources, okay? So it's really unrestricted resources. And remember, even if the governing board says that uh, something's restricted, it's still considered to be uh, without donor restriction. So receipts of unrestricted without donor restriction resources are reported in the operating section, okay? Cash payments to suppliers, employees, cash payments for interest, very similar to what you see in commercial, okay? So just go ahead and flashcard the nature of some of these things that go into the operating activity section, okay? Investing activity section, nothing shocking here. Investments in property, plant, and equipment. Sometimes a not-for-profit will maybe sell a work of art or something, and there'll be some cash proceeds that'll come in for that, or proceeds from the sale of assets that were received in a prior period and whose sale proceeds were restricted to investment in equipment. Um, so I give you a vehicle and I say, hey, you can sell the vehicle, but the money that comes from that vehicle needs to be used to purchase other vehicles or something. Well, that money, when you sell that, would be reported in the investing section of the statement of cash flows. Okay, so go ahead and flashcard the things that uh, nature, uh, you know, generally go into the investing, and then financing activities. Nothing surprising here. Issuance of bonds, repayments of amounts to be borrowed uh, from from amounts borrowed. Receipts from contributions restricted for the purpose of acquiring, constructing, or improving property, plant, and equipment, or um, long-term assets. And then receipts from contributions restricted for the purpose of establishing or increasing an endowment fund. These are all considered financing activities, okay? So when we start receiving contributions and those contributions are restricted for longer-term purposes, that goes into financing. If we see the contribution and it's unrestricted, that's gonna go where? Operating, okay? Now, um, when we receive money and it's for some sort of long-lived asset, that's going to be reported in financing, right? What about when we buy that equipment? Where do we report that? Investing. Investing, right. Kathy, you're muted. Good, you know, that would go into what? That would go into the investing section. So it comes in as financing, it goes out as investing, right? Okay, good. Now you come over and um, you take a look at the example uh, statement of cash flows. And I think it's, you know, worth noting here, okay? The change in net assets is being reported and so let me ask you, is that the direct or indirect method? Indirect. Right. Good, very good. Okay, and just to confirm that, go over to page 15, turn back, flip back to page 15. Okay, that's why I exit. Um, and just flip over to page 15 real quick. And when you 
look at page 15. Why did I, I mean, not page 15, guys, page 13. We'll fix that when we go back. Let's go to page 13 now. Fix that. Page 13, the statement of activities, right? Notice that my what? My total change in net assets is that number 15,450, right? Okay, so. They're reporting the total change in both the combined with and without donor imposed restrictions, right? So you have a little bit of a wrinkle there in that, well, wait a minute, because if money comes in with a donor restriction for long-term purposes, I'm supposed to report that what? I'm supposed to report that down in the financing section. Meanwhile, I'm reporting a net income number that includes contributions of that nature. So there's this little bit of this weird maneuver that you have to do, which we can go back now. And I want you to put not see page 15, but let's see page 13. Okay. But let's just look at that maneuver that they do here, which is notice um interest and dividend restricted for reinvestment they subtract it there and they subtract it there so that they can do what so they can it's basically plugged in down here that 300 okay so i thought that's kind of a weird maneuver that you have to do on the not-for-profit statement of uh, cash flows because you're reporting a net income number, change in net assets, which includes amounts that came in with donor restrictions for long-term purposes. So you have to back it out of the operating so you can put it down there in the financing section where they want it, okay? Nothing else really terribly um, interesting here. Notice these different, uh, you know, proceeds from contributions restricted, right? Just as we saw. And then again, um, some longer term items in the financing section. Okay. Okay, good. Let's just go ahead and let's take a look at uh, this question. I'm of the opinion that FASB could solve a lot of the weirdness of the statement of cash flows by just requiring the direct method. Stop this indirect method where we try to turn net income into cash provided by operations. You start getting into all kinds of weirdness like interest being reported as non-operating on the income statement and in the operating section on the statement of cash flows. What the hell's going on? If they got rid of the indirect method, that would be unnecessary anyway. Go ahead with this question. It's a poll. I'm very confused about the distinction between with and without donor activities once we get into the statement of cash flows. Just, just saying. <laughs> okay. Well, it's like all of a sudden we mush them together. Okay. Yeah, I'm not quite following that, but let's just go ahead and let's. Um, let's Maybe end that the gets clear later i don't know okay let's just end the poll okay and uh because we're kind of 
all over the place on this one. So I don't think you're alone on that. So let's just go ahead and let's look at this question. Okay, talk through some of this. So cash contribution of 500,000 without a donor restriction. If it's without a donor restriction, is it restricted? No. Did we say that unrestricted amounts go into the operating activity? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so I know that D is wrong. And so a little bit of help there. I'm up for A, B, or C, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then I have a con cash contribution with a donor restriction. If I have a contribution with a donor restriction, that needs to be reported where? Investing. I thought it was financing. Well, when you get money, you're not really investing. It's oh, yeah. financing, isn't it? Now, when you buy the equipment that maybe was contemplated with this contribution, then it goes as a use of cash in the investing section, right? Right? Yeah. Okay. So the answer here has got to be C then. What's confusing? <laughs> What's I'm not confusing? <laughs> um, so then, if is it always? Let's say it's a it's it's a restricted funds, but it's for short term use. Um, so would that show up in? Operating. That would still show up in financing activities because it's restricted, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it's for short term use, if it's restricted, then it's going to show up in the um, in the uh, contributions with restrictions need to show up in the financing. Always. OK. Yeah, that's so, helpful. So if it's not if it's restrict or if the restrictions is like related to like. To, you know, some kind of operating activity, um, it still goes into financing. So like in the, in the question, it said with specific requirements relative to the acquisition of property. Yeah. So I can see how that goes down into financing section, but what if they said like, oh, the restriction is for, I don't know, um, is the restriction is like, it needs to be used for, to for educational grant or something or scholarships or something like that. It does, it, it still goes into the financing activity. I don't know if I was clear, if I said that clearly. No, you did. Um, you know, I, I see what you're saying. Um, if it wasn't, something that was restricted for a long-term purpose. Yeah, I think you wouldn't necessarily report it down in financing activities because it's gonna be included in the change in net assets, right? And I don't think there's any stipulation that you then back it out uh, of, the, um, of the operating, if it's something like that where you can you know, award the scholarship and you can award it anytime, let's say in the example that you're giving. So yeah, I would probably have to stipulate that it was for some longer term purpose. But having said that, I really think you're probably better off going with this idea of if it's restricted, then you know we're going to report it as a operating activity. If it, I mean, if it's unrestricted operating, if there was a restriction there, I would go ahead and err on the side of putting it into the uh, financing, because often it's going to be, um, you know, for a longer term purpose. That's what they're testing. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And then that gets a little confusing because cash contribution, two hundred donor restriction. 
specify requirements. They don't tell me, are they using the direct method, indirect method? Because if they're using indirect method, that 200,000 would have to be reclassed out of operating and into financing. So anyway, but um, net net C would still be the right answer, right? Okay. Okay, good. So let's just go ahead and let's take a look at revenue recognition. Okay, now revenue recognition is kind of a um, misnomer here in that we're not really talking so much about revenue, which what which contemplates this notion that the entity has done something to earn those revenue. It's instead uh, with the notion that we are receiving contribution. Okay, so when you see the word contribution, okay, you will sometimes see contribution revenue. That means it's a contribution. If you just see the word revenue, that typically means that they did what? The not-for-profit did something to earn that money. They provided some sort of service or something. Okay, but you see the word contribution revenue, don't get confused, that means contribution. So when they say contribution, they really mean, uh, when they say revenue here, they really mean contribution revenue. Okay, so you come over and um, we could have revenue from exchange transactions, however, and that really is now uh, revenue, <laughs> okay? So the following examples of revenues are student tuition, patient service, membership fees, okay? So I probably shouldn't have written the word contribution here, okay? Um, just note that sometimes they'll say contribution revenue. That means contribution. If it just says revenue, then that's typically going to be that the not-for-profit has provided some sort of service for that. That's just going to be listed as revenue. And that is automatically considered what? Automatically considered without donor restriction. Okay. Now, what we do here is we start getting into not so much the mechanics of where things are reported on the statement of activities, but rather should they even be recognized on the statement of activities as a contribution, okay? So if we have a cash contribution, cash contribution be recognized as revenue, uh, re recognizes contributions that increase net assets without donor restrictions and, um, Well, that's not what I want. Sorry, guys. Contribution be recognized as revenues or gains and reported contributions, and they should be reported. Here it is. They should be reported in the period they are received. Flashcard that. Cash contribution, you recognize it a revenue when? In the periods received. Okay. Now, if we have pledges, promises to give, and it's an unconditional promise. An unconditional promise um, is recognized when the promise is made, flashcard that. So what happens? I tell you, hey, I'm gonna contribute to Save the Canines, and I promise I'm gonna give you $500, $5,000, $10,000, no condition. That's recognized as a revenue on the statement of activities. It comes under contribution and it could be with or without a donor restriction, right? It's recognized as a contribution when I make the promise. Okay. Now, I could have a conditional promise. And with a conditional promise, okay, recognition does not occur until the conditions are substantially met. Okay, flashcard that. So now I say, hey, save the canines, I'm going to give 
but I'm going to give $10,000 when you have found a home for 10 dogs. Well, now what happens? Well, now I, uh, the not-for-profit Save the Canine has, can't recognize that revenue until they found a home for how many dogs? 10, right? Mm -hmm. What if they find a home for five dogs? Can they take half of it? No. Negotiation. 10. Uh huh? There's no negotiation. It's 10. What if they find a home for nine and a half dogs? Okay, well, now you could maybe maybe say, because what one of the dogs is going to take pups and blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, we found a home for it. You might be able to, you know, kind of work that in. But again, the point here, don't fall for the trick where they're going to make it sound like, well, they partially met it, so give them a percentage of that revenue. No, when the conditions are substantially met. Now, again, it is important to note the difference between a conditional and unconditional promise and the what, with or without donor restriction. So I could give you a what? An unconditional promise with a donor restriction, or I could give you what? A conditional promise without a donor restriction. As soon as you find the home for the 10 dogs, you can use the money however you want for the not-for-profit, right? So if, if, a, if an entity offers, if somebody offers to donate and they say, I'm gonna give you $1,000, but only if you can match my thousand dollars with other fundraising, like you hear a lot of matching pledges, um, mm -hmm. then they can't recognize the revenue until they find the other thousand dollars to match to get yours, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. And if I say, and by the way, when you find that money, you have to use it for program A. Okay. Then when they find the money, now it hits a statement of activities. Where on the statement of activities? With donor restriction. If I sit there and I say, once you find the other thousand, you can use it however you want. When they find the other thousand, it hits the statement of activities under the without donor restriction column. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and we talk about multi-year pledges. Okay. Multi-year pledges are recorded at present value the day the pledge is made. Future collections are considered uh, donor restricted revenue. It's a time restriction. And the difference between the previously recognized amount and the present value is recognized as contribution revenue, not interest income. Again, if it says contribution in front of the word revenue, we mean contribution. Okay, now let's just go ahead and, you know, do ourselves a little example here. Let's say I tell you, I'm gonna give you $500 next year. And you look and you say, okay, well, I have to take the present value of that. And so we'll say that the present value of the $500 is 475. On the date that I make the promise, you would go ahead and debit pledge is receivable for 475. I'm just making up the present value. And you would credit contribution For 475. Now, when you report that, you would report that what? On the statement of activities under the with donor restriction column because it's time restricted, because you can't spend the money because you don't have it yet. That's the <laughs> restriction. Okay. Then in year two, I go ahead and I pay you. And so now, of course, the not for profit debits cash, 500. They credit the pledge receivable. For 475 and the additional amount that comes in is now contribution. For $25. Okay, it's not interest. Okay, flashcard all that up there. Okay, good. Now you come over and we talk about uh, allowance for uncollectible uh, pledges. So when you look at the um, allowance for uncollectible pledges, um, I'll talk to you about that later. I don't wanna to talk to you about it here. I have another place to talk to you about it. So uh, don't wanna talk about it here. Hang on a second. Guys. I thought there was somewhere else to put that. Yeah, we'll look at that. Uh, hmm. No, let's look at it now. 
I know I have another place. One second. We can talk about that in a couple of different places. Um, yeah, let's do it now. Okay, right here. Um, an allowance for uncollectible pledges should be recorded. Um, and I'm just going to allowance for uncollectible pledges should be recorded. I'm not going to highlight the rest of that in accords with commercial accounting principles, because then they say that. Um, and then they say, oh, you know, then they say, however, in contrast to commercial accounting principles, there is no bad debt expense. OK, um, so they tell us that the pledge and related contribution are reported net of any allowance. So I guess you could highlight that whole and flashcard that whole. I see now how they're doing in accordance with commercial accounting for the receivable part, which is net of any collectible amount. So you'd have the gross receivable. You'd show a subtract for the allowance and the amount that you put into the allowance goes into the bad debt expense, right? Which is what you do in commercial, but in uh, not-for-profit, you reduce the revenue by the amount you think you're not gonna collect. Time for a numerical example, John. So you would go ahead and you would do what? You would debit pledges receivable, say for a thousand, but let's say your experience is that 10% of the time people don't pay that, right? And so what happens? I'll go ahead and I'll credit the allowance for $100. And then I'll credit contribution for 900, okay? And I do this because we don't have, we can't say, well, there's an expense associated with this raising this revenue because people gave me the money. I didn't do anything to get this money. So it's not really an expense, right? Okay, so you reduce the contribution by the amount that you think you're not going to collect and you set up the allowance with me so far. Okay, now what happens? You gotta be careful because what if it was a service being provided by the not-for-profit? So now, instead of a contribution, the not-for-profit provided a service um, for, I don't know, doggy grooming or something for $1,000, right? And they determined that 10% of the time, the customers don't pay. Well, now, if that's the case, I will credit what? Accounts receivable for 1000 I'll credit revenue for the full thousand, and then I'll debit bad debt expense for a hundred and credit the allowance for a hundred, if assuming it was 10%. So you gotta be careful if it's a contribution pledges, yeah, do it this way. If the entity has provided some sort of service that they're billing for and their experience is that they won't collect all of that, then you do it the way you would commercial. Okay. Okay, good. Let's look at split interest agreements. Okay. And split interest agreements represent donor contribution under which a not for profit receives benefits that are shared with another beneficiary, for example, a charitable remainder trust. Okay. Now, Assets and liabilities recognized under split interest agreement should be disclosed separately from assets and liabilities in the statement of financial position. So you'd have to report those separately as you would contributions and changes in the value of split interest agreements separately on the uh, statement of activities, okay? Split interest agreements should be measured at fair value and, um, displayed as donor restricted flashcard that now you come over and me, um, I, I have a question. one second a one second one second so then you come over and when you look at um the um on canvas not canvas but on um whatever the hell they call this thing e-learning um you come over 
And you can see here that I have not unhidden <laughs> the chapter eight slides. Turn editing on, John. Okay, so let me unhide those. Why is it not letting me unhide them? Did I turn the editing on or off? Turn editing on. Okay, chapter eight. I want to unhide those. Show them, okay. And what I'm gonna show you right now, Kathy, and then you can ask your question. I just wanna show you that in those slides, I've gone ahead and given you um, a little bit more information about um, these split interest agreements, okay? So uh, some of the things that I had you highlight, split interest agreements, represent donor contributions of trust or other arrangements under which the not-for-profit organization receives benefits that are shared with other beneficiaries. So right pretty much out of the textbook, okay? Then I go ahead and I give you this little bit more information, agreements such as charitable remainder trust, okay, which I had you highlight in the book, represent donor contribution structure to simultaneously donate assets to the not-for-profit and share those assets with the beneficiary. Split interest agreements are displayed separately on the not-for-profit organization's financial statements measured at their fair value and recorded as um, restricted, temporarily restricted. Guys, I took this from something that was a while back. This is donor restricted, okay? Donor with donor restriction, okay? With donor restriction. Uh, unless otherwise uh, restricted by the donor, it could be uh, um, it could be a permanent restriction versus temporary. But now we just need to worry with donor restriction. So when you get the money, you debit the asset cash usually. You credit the liability and you credit the contribution revenue. And again, it's going to be showing as with donor restriction. We don't break them out anymore into whether they are. Um, whether they are uh, temporary or permanent, okay? Now, you come over, and I know it's hard to see, guys, so you're going to have to kind of do one of these numbers where you kind of press your face against the screen a little bit here um, so that you can look at this, and I'm going to sort of read through it with you, okay? And again, you have the slides up here, and you can read it on your own again when you look at the slides from uh, e-learning. But this is saying that on December, um, I'm just going to highlight it as I read, on December 30th, 20X1, Albert Altruistic donated 200000 to the Carbon Museum under the terms and conditions of a charitable remainder trust. Mr. Altruistic, uh, a lifetime tax-free, gave a life, wants a lifetime tax-free annuity of 20000 per year and bequest the remainder to car carbon for the use in the furtherance of their mission of the museum. Independent actuaries have estimated that the museum's liability is 84,258. That's the present value. That's basically saying how much we think we're gonna have to pay this geezer, I mean, this nice guy off until he dies, right? Okay. As a result, the carbon museum should record the following. The cash comes in, 200,000, we would credit the liability for the portion that we're estimating we're going to have to give to Mr. Altruistic. And the difference, this 115000 is going to come in. And again, um, I need to fix that. It's no longer called, ah, it's no longer called uh, temporary restricted. It is now what? It would now be with donor restriction. So then okay. a split yeah. uh, a split interest agreement, what's being given to the organization is basically a contract, correct? Or like contractual rights rather than necessarily a check. No, it could be cash. 
They could hand him cash. Why can't he hand him cash? Well, it says he got a trust. And so I guess I'm trying to figure out- $200,000. Said it donated two hundred thousand dollars. Oh, but it's subject to this trust. It's governed by this trust. Is that is that how that works? I, I'm I'm just totally unfamiliar with this. So <laughs> I don't know what you're asking me. They gave him two hundred thousand okay. dollars under the split interest agreement. <laughs> so okay, so okay, so they did. He did get two two hundred thousand, but then the organization has responsibilities according to this contract, right? Correct. Yeah, that's what that that's is. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just the, that's trying to wrap my brain. Part. Yeah. Okay, I was just trying to wrap my brain around what this was. So that's yeah. okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, good. Um, where are we? Back to the textbook, right? Okay, so now we look and we come down. So just flashcard the things I asked you to guys, which is what we saw in those slides, but I think those slides help illustrate what's going on here, okay? All right, good. Now let's just come over and come back to donated services, okay? So what happens? Let's go back to save the canines. Let's say that um, we need little doggy kennels, you know, so the dogs have their own little doggy apartments because we don't want them to be fighting with each other and mixing inappropriately and all that kind of stuff. And so we go ahead and we set up little doggy kennels, right? So we hire somebody to come in. The person comes in and says, hey, I'm a carpenter. I have these specialized skills. I always wanted to help animals though. Um, I'll tell you what, no charge for my work. Should I recognize the value of that donated service? Well, let's see what they tell us. They tell us that what donated services are generally not recorded. However, there is exception to that when certain criteria are met. One is they create a non-financial -financial asset such as land building. So would this doggy kennel thing qualify? Yeah, we would recognize the value of that, right? Or they require a specialized skill, okay? So let's say we have a veterinarian that comes in and the veterinarian comes in and checks the general health and condition of the dogs. And halfway through the year, they say, um, hey, you know what? No more charges for the rest of the year. Is that a specialized skill, veterinary medicine? Yes, so we would go ahead and recognize the value of that for that back half of the year. So to take a look at the criteria, we recognize contribution revenue some of the time, specialized skill, and guys, they're kind of rolling, you know, both of these into the specialized skill. The idea that it's enhancing a financial asset probably means, I mean, a non-financial asset such as a building means that there was probably some specialized skill. So specialized skill otherwise needed by the organization and the amount is measured easily, okay? Exam questions tend to focus uh, right here, specialized skill, and create or enhance uh, a building. So you can flashcard this some criteria, but make sure you have that non-financial asset component in there next to that specialized skill. Okay. Okay, good. Come over. Um, what happens, let me ask you a couple questions on that because sometimes those questions get a little tricky. What happens if it's secretarial services? Is that a specialized skill? No. Yeah, you need to turn off your account and elitistness for this one. Okay. Secretarial skill is specialized yeah. skill. So be careful. Don't look to, you know, how impressed you are with the skill. Does it require something that somebody just can't walk in and start doing? And I guarantee you can't walk in and be a secretary tomorrow if you don't have any appropriate training for that. Okay. Uh, how about picking up dog poop at, um, say, the canines? No. Okay. Anybody just with a shovel, you know, a, a, a retired accountant comes to the door and says, I want to help. 
And we say, well, we don't need any accounting services from you. We've got that covered. So anything else you can do? The person says, no, but I'm an auditor and I never helped anyone my whole life. I want to help somebody. And we hand them a shovel to go pick up in the back. Okay. Is that a specialized skill? No. So you don't look to the skills that are possessed by the individual. You look to say, are they providing us? with a skill and anything outside of just a common thing like you know changing uh, bedpans i guess is what is considered a specialized skill okay now if you sit there and um it is basically a service then like most services you expense it when the service is provided right if it is what? Enhancing the non-financial asset, then you would debit what? Then you would debit asset, right? So for service, let me do it this way. For service, it's expense. If it's what? Enhancing a non-financial asset, now I gotta go way the hell up here, then it becomes what? Then it becomes an asset. Okay? Okay, good. Okay, now you come over. And, uh, and I I'm, I'm, wasn't calling yet, anyone out to be an elitist, so I, please don't take it as a put down. Okay. Okay, good. Let's come over and, oh, very important, guys. Um, contribution, right? You have to credit contribution, okay? Contribution at the time that that's provided. Okay. Okay, good. Come over and let's take a look at... Uh, donated collection items. So what happens? I'm sitting over here in Hayward and uh, there's something called the Hayward Museum. Okay, Hayward Historical Museum. And in there, there's everything you ever wanted to know about the city of Hayward. There's so much about the city of Hayward in there, it takes you like 10 minutes to go through that place. Okay. Um, I call a friend and go, no, come to Hayward. I'll take you to the Hayward Museum. I'm thinking, okay, you know, it's going to be a really cool time we spend together. We'll be at the museum for a couple hours. It'll be great. I'm done like in 10 minutes. I'm like, no, now what do I do? Okay, so it's got everything about the history of Hayward. But if you go to the back, there are three pitchforks that were used to start the city of Hayward. There's a golden pitchfork, a silver pitchfork, and a bronze pitchfork. Does Hayward have to include those pitchforks on their financial reports, on their statement of financial position, okay? And let's take a look. Donated collection items or work of historical treasure are not recorded by the recipient if all of the following requirements are met. So the item is part of the collection, held for public viewing, it is cared for and protected, an organization has a policy that if it sells one of those items, it has to use the proceeds to acquire other collection items. So if Hayward met all those criteria, it would not have to put those collection items on their financial report. If they don't meet all those criteria, then they have to put it, okay? Full disclosure, there are no pitchforks back there because I always feel like people think I'm serious and then they go and they go, I didn't see the pitchforks. There's no pitchforks. Okay, I'm just saying the, the, there is a Hayward Historical Museum and it's awful. Okay, let's go ahead and let's take a look at donated materials. So now, you know, somebody gives us um, some doggy toys. Okay, what happens? If that's the case, donated materials, debit asset, credit contribution. Okay, now let's say they give us something that merely passes through the organization. So now they give us dog food. Well, if that's the case, then what? Then we would debit expense and credit contribution. Or if, uh, you know, you're giving used clothes or something like that, that would be considered something that passes through the organization. Okay, so if it's something that's going to last a little longer, debit the asset. If it's something that just passes through the organization, then you're gonna go ahead and debit expense, okay? What are gifts in kind? 
Gifts in kind are when the not-for-profit receives something other than cash. For example, they give us, I don't know, the San Francisco Giants, the Oakland A's, give us tickets to their ball game. Now, what are we going to do with those tickets? We dogs don't go to baseball games. How can we help the dog with that? We say, I know. We'll take those items and we'll sell them at, uh, we'll auction them off at like a silent auction. And not-for-profits have these silent auctions and they usually, you know, have a, some wine there. So people get a little tipsy in a good mood and bid these things up. Okay, so what happens when we get the gift in kind, we will value it at fair value when it's received and then revalue it as um, upon their sales, part of the fundraising appeal. The difference between the fair value at the time of donation is accounted and when it's finally sold is accounted for as an additional contribution. So I don't know, let's just say they give us the tickets and just let's say the tickets have a value of $100 when they give them to us. When they give them to us, we would go ahead and debit contribution, I mean, debit tickets, excuse me, uh, 100, credit contribution, 100, right? Then, you know, people bid them up and, you know, people are having fun at this thing and they really want those tickets. And so what happens? They go ahead and they bid the tickets up to 150. Well, now they have to pay me 150 to get the tickets. Of course, I credit the tickets for 100 and I credit what? I credit contribution for now the additional 50. Okay. All right, good. So just flashcard that. Here it was. I knew somewhere else there was what you should do with the. Um, you know, with the situation where you're not going to collect the whole amount, you reduce the contribution by the amount you think you're not going to collect. Being careful to look out if it's a service that's being provided, then you would use that debt expense and recognize the revenue gross. Okay, okay good. Come over and let's talk about fundraising. Okay. And when a not-for-profit offers premiums, such as calendars and whatnot, those are considered a fundraising expense. Flashcard that, okay? The what? The difference between contribution made and the fair value of any premium transfer is considered a contribution revenue. Flashcard that. And... Um, I had an experience, I was involved with uh, an organization called the Association for Latina, um, Association, well, at that time it was called the American Association of Hispanic CPAs, now it's the Association of Latino Professionals for America, which is a very annoying name in my opinion because, well, there's a lot of professionals that are for America that they're not including as part of their membership target, for example, housekeepers are professionals that are for America. So why not reach out to the very large, you know, uh, SEIU union, the service workers and institutional workers union, which has a lot of Latinos that are for America as a lot of Hispanics are for America, but that's not the group they want, okay? And it used to just be the Hispanic CPAs. Anyway, stop, John. So um, we, there was an individual I met at Bank of America and I kept telling him, Joe, you need to join the organization. You need to join the organization. Meanwhile, I want Bank of America money as a contribution. Well, Joe was no fool. He had been around a little bit. So he finally shows up to one of the meetings and he says, here I am. And he says, look, um, I know I have to pay my membership dues. Will this cover it? And he pulls out a $5,000 check contribution for, from Bank of America to the organization. So what happens? The dues was $50. So we would take what? We would take a revenue for the dues of 50 and show a contribution of 4,950 in that example. Okay, so that's the way that works. You can just go ahead and flashcard that. Okay, okay, good. Now let's look at industry specific. Okay, 
And again, there is not a whole lot. We've been studying generically what FASB says all not-for-profits have to do, but we're just going to put a couple of cherries on top here now that start to talk about specific special stuff related to we'll do educational institutions, we'll do hospitals, and then we're going to sort of have a catch-all of special topics such as investments and that sort of thing for not-for-profits, okay? So revenues for, you know, as you're painfully aware, I'm sure, for educational institutions include tuition, could be, you know, government grants, that sort of thing, okay? Now, if there are canceled classes, okay, then you would subtract that from the assessed student fees to get gross tuition fees, which I find very annoying that they call it gross after you subtract something. Okay, so that's a little annoying, but just think of it like sales returns. Okay, we have our gross sales minus returns as net sales, right? But the thing that's a little annoying about the way they do it for the CPA exam, they say, well, how do you calculate gross revenue? You'd subtract cancel classes. Okay. Okay, good. Now, if we're talking about now uh, patients for hospitals now, okay, healthcare organizations, then we have patient service revenue, okay? And central transactions include services such as surgery, recovery room, that sort of thing. These things constitute patient revenue. So I always think to myself, if it sounds like something that would hurt, then it's patient revenue, okay? If they're gonna do something that sounds painful, that's patient revenue, okay? Now, you come over and we say that patient service revenue should be accounted for at established standard rates, even if the full amount is not expected to be collected. And then even though we will do what? It recorded on a gross basis, deductions are made from gross revenue to recognize the net patient service revenue net of deductions, okay? So let's just come over and underscore the word deductions. And from that blue down there, let's go ahead and start to take a look at the nature of some of these deductions. And I want you to flashcard the nature of deductions, okay? So deductions from patient service revenue to co calculate net patient service revenue are contractual adjustments, policy discounts, okay? So what happens? If you were to be, you know, this is really prior to Obamacare, but if somebody were to be wheeled into a hospital with a broken leg with no insurance, the hospital would charge them $15,000 to fix that leg. If you get wheeled into a hospital with Blue Shield, then they're gonna charge Blue Shield, but they're not gonna charge Blue Shield 15,000 because Blue Shield would have what? Would have negotiated a better price for that because Blue Shield's saying, you want this volume, don't you? And the hospital would say, yes, we want the Blue Shield contract. So they'll negotiate a better deal that's why some people thought that if there is one payer of all medical costs, that would bring the price down. Um, that is not the case, however. But uh, still, you know, when you come in under a uh, insurance, they may originally record that at the fifteen thousand dollars, but then they would make an adjustment to get to net per patient revenue for whatever the uh, third party rate is. Also. And this would be included also on the flashcard of um, right here on the flashcard. That's flashcard for um, for deductions. Charity care is not recognized as a revenue or receivable. So flashcard those things that are really kind of like deductions to calculate net patient revenue. Okay. Now you come over and you take a look. And um, other operating revenue. Okay, now when we get into other operating revenue, I want you to flashcard these. This is not patient care. So, patient care is what? 
is our main central category of revenue. But if we're, for example, a teaching hospital like Stanford Medical, we could have what? Tuition from schools, revenue from educational programs, donated supplies. Guys, flashcard all of these. Okay, and I know it's annoying, but um, I don't want you to miss a question because the examiners got full of themselves and wanted to see if you knew to what specifically should be uh, other operating revenue for a hospital. And then non-operating revenue, okay, tends to be what? Tends to be interest from, get, from um, dividends and then stuff that is basically given to the hospital, including what? Donated services would be considered non-operating. So just flashcard those because I've seen enough questions that are just annoying that they're asking you, you know, is this non-operating? Is this operating, other operating? Is it patient service revenue? When I could look that up in the AICPA's guide for healthcare organizations if I was in practice. Meanwhile, the examiners expect you to walk in with that bouncing around in your head somewhere, okay? And you can also flashcard along with the detail that we have the three broad categories that we have just been talking about. Okay, okay, good. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at a couple questions here. Okay, guys, ready? Let's go ahead and um, end the poll and take a look at this one. And um, yeah, okay, most of us got it right. Now, um, let's just take a look and see how this one um, would have been answered. Okay, so you look at this and again, a cash contribution of 875 to be used at the um, board of directors discretion. 
Do you think this is with or without donor restriction? Without. 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 Okay, good. <clears throat> WO is without. A promise to contribute 500,000 in year eight. Now this pledge is being made in year seven and um, they're not gonna get the money until year eight. So do you think this is with or without? With. Good. This is a with because it has the time restriction, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So once you realize that, let's just go right there with that. There is no way that A or C can be the right answer because we know we have 500,000 with, right? Okay. So then you start looking and it just comes down to a question of, should I include this 100,000 of legal services as a contribution? And the answer is what? Yes. yes, I should because it's a specialized service, isn't it? Okay, and so it's gotta be D. Now you sit there and you say, okay, John, but how do I know that's without donor restriction? I'm still confused, okay? Well, look, it's without, you know, it's without donor restriction because I can't get to the answer if I don't include that 100,000, right? But it's without donor restriction because you recognize a service like legal services as an expense in the period that the service is provided and how would it get out of the what? out of the with donor restriction column, it could not. So it has to be under the without donor restriction because I'm gonna take that expense under the without donor restriction column, right? Yep. Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look at question two. Okay, something's not right here um, on the responses. I have a feeling that some of you are just saying, let's just get on with it. Okay, so fine with me. I, you know, wouldn't mind taking an early nap either, but because <laughs> um, I'm looking at this, maybe you got it reversed because uh, somebody picked A and I'm like, huh? Um, but let's just look at this one. Okay, um, so they get 100,000 and Pika received, oh, I see. I see why you picked 10,000, my bad. Okay, I didn't realize it had. They received 10,000 prior to year end. Pika anticipates collecting 90% of the contribution, blah, blah, okay? Um, now, the entire contribution can be recognized 
it doesn't matter that they gave them the cash, right? Because they gave them the contribution. It didn't stipulate in here that it was conditional. And it's in fact, it said it was unconditional. And um, they don't say that the amounts are going to be provided in another period. Well, they'll probably maybe be paid later, but it doesn't matter because they're not asking me about with or without donor restriction. They just want contribution revenue. They don't put any label on it, right? So what happens? So I sit there and I'm going to recognize the entire 100,000 as a pledge is receivable, which I'm going to be a PR of 100,000. I'm going to what set up an allowance for the amount I think I'm not going to collect, which in this example would be what 10,000. And then I credit the contribution net of the amount that I think I'm not going to collect the 90,000, right? Question? Okay, good. Let's look at question three here. I'm sorry, I'm slow to get to my mute button. Why would we say? Why do we say they don't expect to collect the 10,000? It looked like they collected prior to year end. Well, they collected 10,000. They expect to collect 80,000 more. Got you. Oh, okay, got you, got you. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would have figured that out as basically 90% of the remaining 90,000, but then I realized that wasn't a choice, so. Well, uh, Pika received an unconditional promise of 100,000 expected to be collected within one year. Pika received 10,000 prior to year end. If I set up, I mean, just think of your allowance accounting and commercial. If I set up an allowance of 10,000 at the time that the say the sale is made, and then I collect on that sale, then I would debit cash of 10,000 and credit the pledges receivable of 10,000, but there's no effect on the allowance, right? Collecting cash. Now, you know, look, if you're telling me that this was the one and only receivable an entity has and they collect the whole thing, then they should, and in the case of a not-for-profit, I guess they would debit the allowance and credit contribution for 10 if they got the whole 100. But there was nothing in this question that indicated that that happened. You know, it's equivalent to saying, you know, sometimes my students ask me an introductory, well, would there ever not be uh, an allowance? And my answer is, yeah, if they collect all the receivables and they have a receivable balance of zero. But the accounting standards tell us as long as you have outstanding receivables, you have to use some historical number to determine what's uncollectible and show an allowance for that, don't you? Okay. Okay, good. The point here, I'll throw the baby out with the bathwater here. The point here is that you reduce the contribution by the amount you estimate you're not going to collect. Okay. All right, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at number three. Now I see where some of the confusion was coming from on that one. We're gonna get the poll up. Yep, I'm doing it right now. Oh, sorry. It's all right, I'm a little slow. The older I get, the slower I get. So don't expect any improvements. <laughs> I received an evaluation and uh, they check needs improvement, so I quit. And they say, well, why are you quitting? I said, because I am not improving. <laughs> so, I've accepted that. <laughs> Things will go, will, at this point of my life, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to get very sick and die at some point.
Okay, let's go ahead and let's take a look at uh, what we got here. And uh, okay, B is the right answer. Um, so let's just take a look at this one. I think we might be getting a little tired here, but um, let's take a look. A not-for-profit organization received $150 from a donor and the donor receives two tickets to a theater show as acknowledgement the tickets have a fair value of 100. So if that's the case, the contribution is going to be what? Is going to be $50, right? They would debit the cash, 150. They would credit the tickets for 100 and credit contribution for 50, right? Okay, good. Let's look at this one now. Oh, poll. Poll time. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and uh, give you a couple more minutes on this, a couple more seconds on this. I'll give you about 15 more seconds. Okay, so that's a good uh, two minutes there on that one. So um, let's just take a look and um, okay. Most of us got it right, but uh, this is kind of a hard question. So let me just take the poll down and let's go through this together. Okay, so what happens? They give us the gross patient revenue. Okay, and they tell us the gross patient revenue is 775. They want the net patient revenue. So I know I've got to start with that 775 number, right? Okay, then they tell me that this figure includes charity care. Are we supposed to report charity care? Nope. No. Nope. So we got to back that off, 25,000. Okay. It's not a bad debt expense. It's just, you just don't count it. Okay. <laughs> then what? Then they give me provision for bad debts. I'm going to 
think about that for a second. But then they tell me difference between established billing rates and fees negotiated with third party contractual adjustments. And remember, we said that what? Deductions are made for contractual adjustments, right? So we have to subtract that from the gross revenue to get to the net. And then they tell me provision for bad debts. Now your instinct is to, to subtract that, but this is not contribution. This is what? This is a service being provided from the hospital for which they are anticipating what? That they will not be paid. You take a bad debt expense for that, don't you? Mm -hmm. You don't reduce that off of the revenue to report in that revenue. So you have to go ahead then and do the calculation. And that's how we got the 680. So contrast that, guys. And I warned you about that earlier, right? Remember when I was looking for it? You have to have the contrast between what you do when it's a uncollectible from a revenue standpoint versus a contribution. Contribution, reduce the contribution. If it's a revenue where you're providing a service, then that's going to constitute a bad debt expense. And you do not reduce that off the revenue. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and do this next one. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and um, take a look at this one. And um, again, this is one of those questions where you just got a flashcard, which, you know, what the different categories are for revenue. I can't think of any other way other than FASB has called out, you know, these different categories and what should go in there. And so it tells us they purchase medicines from field pharmaceutical at a cost of 5,000. However, field notified data that their invoice was being canceled and the medicine was being donated. So donated supplies we have on our flashcard is an other operating revenue. Okay. All right, guys, I think that's enough for tonight. Uh, we still need to get um, module four in for the not-for-profit, which will wrap up not-for-profit. But most of the questions you'll see for chapter eight, the not-for-profit questions are in those first three modules, one, two, and three. And then we'll continue on with chapter eight as we start governmental next time. Okay, it'll take us probably about 10, 15 minutes to finish up this not-for-profit discussion next time. But you've got plenty of work in front of you and that you're gonna have to view some of these lectures and whatnot. Okay, so what I would do is suggest that you get through the three modules that we've covered chapter eight, and then go back and probably pick up around chapter five with the lectures there. As I mentioned, you can reach out to me uh, with questions, et cetera, as you go along. Um, we will not have class on Thursday because I'm going to be watching football and eating turkey on Thursday, as I'm sure you are. 
So have a nice holiday. We will reconvene a week from um, Thanksgiving. What's that? The, what day is that? December already? All right, December 2nd? Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Okay, guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank All you. right. Guys. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Same to you. Yeah. Have Thank a good you. Holiday. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving.